Hey, welcome to The Journey Church. My name is Jason Hatley. I'm the lead pastor here. I'm so glad you're with me today as we continue our teaching series called, What on Earth Am I Here For? And in this new series, we've been answering the big question of life. What is my purpose? Why has God put me here on earth? And here's the truth. God wants you to know your purpose. And that's why in his word, the Bible, he has revealed to us his five biblical purposes for your life and for mine. So in this series, we're discovering these purposes. Now, our first purpose that God created us for is to know him and to love him. We talked about that a few weeks ago during the series. That's the purpose of worship. Uh, A second purpose God has created us for is fellowship, and that's to know his uh, people, his his family in the church, and to be a part of God's family. Last week, we looked at how we are created to become like Christ, and that's the purpose of discipleship. And today, we're going to look at God's fourth purpose for your life, and it's this. You were shaped to serve God. You are shaped to serve God. So if you haven't done so already, click that blue button by the live stream player and download your notes so you can follow along with me in today's outline. Now, this is important because you were intentionally shaped by God to serve God. And and, you know, I'm so excited about how many people in our church just so naturally do this. So many people in our church are serving one another. They're serving God through our church. It's really incredible to see. In fact, just over the course of recent weeks, we've seen this in a big way. Think about our uh, our servant evangelism outreach at the beach and in Delray Beach earlier this year as our as members of our church went out and they served our community and they uh, shared with them the hope and the love of Jesus. Or think about our welcome team who do such an awesome job welcoming people warmly into our church every Sunday here at The Journey. Or I think about our Journey Kids Ministry and our Epic and High School Student Ministry and the incredible volunteers who are serving there, investing in young lives and helping to teach them about God's love. Or how about our worship team who were just literally here uh, with us uh, during the service a few moments ago, leading us in songs that lift us up in our faith and draw us closer to God. And then of course, so many in our church are involved in helping those in need like we uh, did a few weeks ago with our peanut butter and jelly food drive and our Saturday serve at Boca Helping Hands. Now, those are just a few ways that many of the people at our church are involved serving God and serving others. But, you know, there's a flip side to that coin as well, because there's also many people in our church who are not yet involved serving God and serving others. And so as a result, if that's you, you are missing out on this fourth purpose that God created you for. Let's take a look at our first verse for today. It comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, For we are God's masterpiece. If you're following along in your notes, underline that word masterpiece. So God says you are a masterpiece. And so that means that you were created by God. And it's the creator who gives purpose to the creation. That's what this whole series is about. And notice what God does. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So not only has God created us, but he has saved us through Jesus and he has given us new life. Now, why has he done that? Well, one of the reasons is next in your notes. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So don't miss this. God created you as his masterpiece. He saved you through Jesus so that you can do the good things that he created you for, so that you can serve God by serving others. So get this, you know, you are not just here to consume, but to contribute. God made you to make a difference. And it doesn't matter how long you live. What matters is how you live. The Bible says that you are created to serve, you are saved to serve, and you are shaped to serve. And whenever God gives you an assignment, get this, he always gives you the equipment that you need to fulfill that mission, to complete the assignment. Now, God gives you and he provides for you five attributes that help you uh, serve him and serve others. We call this your shape. It stands for spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experiences. So that spells shape, S-H-A-P-E. And these five things, they, they are uniquely 
yours. They are unique to you. There's no one else in the entire world that has your unique mix of spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experience. But get this, even though God made you unique, he didn't give you your shape just for your benefit. No, God has a bigger purpose for your shape. And that's what our memory verse is talking about in 1 Peter 4.10. Let's read this verse aloud together. Are you ready? Go. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Again, take your pen, underline those last three words, serve one another. So why has God given you your shape and these spiritual gifts? He's given them to you so you can serve one another. So your talents are not for your benefit. Your personality is not for your benefit. Now, you may use those things to make a living or to uh, provide for your family or for yourself, but God didn't just give them to you for you. No, I can't say this is uh, enough. Your purpose in life is really not about you. It's about God who created you. God gave you those gifts, those talents, those experiences, those abilities, and all of these things that he has given to you, he's given to you for the benefit of other people, to be used to serve other people. So on your notes, write this down. My fourth purpose is to serve God by serving others. That's the fourth purpose of your life, to serve God by serving others. You want to know why you're alive? That is why you're alive. You are alive to serve God by serving others. You were put here to serve God, not just to take up space. And the way that you serve God is by using your shape to serve other people. You see, some people want to serve God, but they don't want to serve other people. But listen, it doesn't work that way. The only way that we can serve God is by lovingly serving others. And the Bible has a word for this. The word is ministry. In fact, the Bible teaches that every believer is a minister. Now, that doesn't mean that every believer is a pastor or called to full-time vocational ministry, but ministry is simply using your shape to serve God and to serve other people in Jesus' name. So anytime you use your talents or your abilities or your experiences to help somebody in Jesus' name, that is called ministry. And you know what that makes you? Yeah, that makes you a minister. And maybe you say, well, Jason, wait a minute here. Uh, I'm not called to ministry. Oh, yes, you are. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are called to serve other people. So if you're watching church online with someone today, just turn and look at them right now and say, you are a minister. Because it's true. All of us as followers of Jesus, we're all called to ministry. Now, the good news is that God not only created us for service, but God has given us a model for service. And that's who Jesus is. Jesus models for us the right attitudes and the right heart for serving other people. Jesus says, watch me. This is what I want you to do with your life. Now, last week we learned how we are created to become like Christ. And what did Christ do while he was here on earth? He served. In fact, look at Jesus's words in Matthew 20, 28. He says this, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now listen, because this is important. Your shape determines your ministry, but your heart and your attitude determine your maturity. Don't miss that. Your shape determines your ministry. The specific gifts and heart and abilities and personality and experiences, that, that determines the type of ministry that you do. But your heart and your attitude, they determine your spiritual maturity. And the truth is, there are plenty of people who figure out their shape. They get that right, but they don't get the heart and they don't get the attitude right. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Learning to sub- serve other people with Jesus's heart, with Jesus's attitude, the way that Jesus served. You know, a lot of people, they spend their life searching for self-worth and significance, but they're looking in all the wrong places because your self-worth and your self-esteem and your significance, it doesn't come from sex or or salary or status or or success. Those things are going to let you down every time. No, your your self-esteem, that comes from service. 
Jesus says that we are to give our lives away in order to truly find life. And that's why the greatest thrill in life is to be used by God, for God to use you to serve other people. Albert Schweitzer, the great theologian, said, the only really happy people are those who have learned how to serve. So today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to serve like Jesus with the attitude and the heart of Jesus. And it takes three specific attitudes to serve in this way. So here's the first one in your notes. If we're learning how to serve like Jesus, number one is serving like Jesus means being available. Serving like Jesus means being available. So how available are you for God to work through you as you serve him. You know, Jesus one day was walking to the town of Jericho, and he was walking to this town. Uh, A couple of blind men on the side of the road started shouting at Jesus. And here's the story, how it unfolds in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 30. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them. Now, hold your finger right there for just a moment. Isn't that how the crowd usually is? You know, hey, you're disturbing everybody. Just be quiet. I wonder if maybe you and I, if we had been there, maybe we would have joined in the crowd and telling these blind men in need to be quiet. But notice what happened next. But they only shouted louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. When Jesus heard them, he stopped. Now, if you have your pen, I want you to circle that word stopped. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Jesus stopped and called, what do you want me to do for you? So notice what Jesus did. Jesus stopped. And if you want to be used by God, you have to be willing to be interrupted. In fact, just write that down somewhere in the margin of your notes. If you want to be used by God, you have to be willing to be interrupted. You know, most of Jesus's miracles and ministry were interruptions. I mean, think about it. All of the people that he healed, the blind man, uh, the lame man, the sick people, the paralyzed man, the dead child, they were all interruptions. His very first miracle, Jesus was interrupted at a wedding. His second miracle, Jesus was interrupted on his way to Galilee. And here it says, Jesus was interrupted and he stopped. You know, a lot of people like to study the steps of Jesus I think it's really important to study the stops of Jesus and the way that he allowed himself to be interrupted so that he could serve other people because almost everything that Jesus did, he allowed himself to be interrupted to serve God and serve others. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 3.28. If you can help your neighbor now, don't say, come back tomorrow and then I'll help you. You see, servant-hearted people, they don't procrastinate. Here was John Wesley's motto. John Wesley was the founder of Methodism and the great evangelist. He said this, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. That, my friends, is greatness. And that's what it means to serve with the heart and the attitude of Jesus. You must be available and willing to say, okay, God, I'm here. I'm available. Use me how you want to use me. Now, unfortunately, a lot of us, even as Christians say, well, I'd like to be used by God, but you know, I just have so much going on right now. I'm I'm so busy. There's something going on every night of the week. Yeah, I just don't have time. I'm not available. And what is it that keeps us from being available to be used by God? Well, I think there's three main barriers. In your notes, write this down. The first barrier is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. One of the reasons that we're not available to be used by God is because we're just so focused on ourselves. William Sloan Coffin said, there is no smaller package in the world than a man wrapped up in himself. And it's true. The Bible says it this way in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You see, whenever you see a need in front of you, guess what? God is giving you the opportunity in that moment to serve him by serving that person in need. God has given you an opportunity to practice serving. So don't miss this. Whenever you see a need right in front of your face, that need, that opportunity, that is uh, God giving you the opportunity to serve someone else in Jesus' name and to learn to become more like Jesus. So the first barrier is self-centeredness. The second barrier is perfectionism. 
Perfectionism. You know, wanting all the conditions to be perfect before you serve. You know, and you say when it's all perfect, when, when everything settles down, when I'm not so busy, when I've got more income, when I have more opportunity, when I'm not so, you know, uh, wrapped up in this project or my kids' lives, well, that's when I'll serve. But here's the problem. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. Isn't that true? If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. So real servants, Christ-like servants, they do the best they can with what they have for Jesus today. They don't procrastinate until tomorrow. You know, at the journey, we practice uh, what I call the good enough principle. You know, the good enough principle says uh, it doesn't have to be perfect for God to use it and God to bless it. And hey, that's really good because guess what? None of us, none of us are perfect. And so if we had to be perfect for God to use us, God would never be able to use any of us. But God uses normal, flawed, imperfect people because hey, we're all imperfect people. So don't let perfectionism become a barrier to serving. And then the third barrier that we oftentimes throw up when it comes to serving God is this, materialism. Materialism is a barrier to serving God. This insatiable desire for more that we have, it keeps us from being available to serve. Jesus says this in Luke 16, 13, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Take your pen and circle that word cannot. Now notice Jesus didn't say should not. He says you cannot serve both God and money. He says it's impossible. You have to pick. You can't have two number one priorities in life. And here's what happens when we have a lot of things, when we're driven by materialism, we get so busy taking care of things that we don't take care of people. And that's a problem. Because one of the most important decisions that you will make in life once you become a follower of Jesus is to answer the question and say, am I going to be a kingdom builder or am I going to be a wealth builder? Now, if God blesses you with wealth, that's a great thing. You can use that for the glory of God. But you can't make that the number one goal of your life because guess what? You're not going to take any of the wealth that you have here on earth with you to heaven. It's all going to stay behind. But you are going to take your character to heaven. So decide today and say, I'm going to be a kingdom builder. Put that first and let God take care of uh, how he wants to use you to do the rest. So serving means being available. So how do I show God that I am available to serve? Well, uh, a really simple first step is just to begin serving God uh, at least one hour a month here at the journey. And that's my challenge to you today, to commit to serve God one hour a month here at The Journey. And and listen, that's not a lot of time. Everybody here at Church Online, we can all do this. How do you get started? Well, on your connection card, and you may need to minimize the live stream player so you can see your connection card below, but I want to show you there's a next step on your connection card that shows some different ministry teams where you can get involved serving. You can get involved with our welcome team on Sundays or our Journey Kids or student ministry team, with our worship arts team using your gifts to uh, lift us up and and worship, uh, our community ministry team and the ways that we're serving others in our community at the Journey office. There's a lot of ways to get involved. So here's what I want to do. I want you to take a look at that connection card, and I want you to look at those opportunities to serve. And as you do, I want you to watch this brief video from some of the people who are using their gifts and their shape to serve here at The Journey about the blessing of being involved with ministry. As you listen to this, pick a team where you can serve one hour a month. Take a look. Hi, my name is Rachel and I serve on The Journey Kids team. My name is Carla Sagarian and I serve in the welcome team. My name is Alfonso Vallejo, they call me Al. I'm a musician, I'm a drummer, I play with the band, and I also serve on Sundays when my growth group is assigned to serve for that day. My name is Edward Ayala, I'm one of the front of house coordinators here. My favorite part is definitely getting to connect with all the members that sometimes we don't even get to see face to face. It's really nice to have that connection and meet everyone in person. Just to get to know everybody. I love serving kids because I think the kids are the next generation and they just have so much to learn and so much to um, offer us, to teach us as adults. And um, they're just so much fun to be around. 
you'd be surprised at how much you actually put your faith out into these people and the faith that brings out to yourself. If you're interested in serving, just get started. Just fill out a form, send an email, respond to the email, and just have a willing heart because as soon as you're ready, then you'll be able to start. Get yourself just a foot step in the door. Believe it or not, you're actually gonna love it more than you anticipated. So I hope that you will uh, check that next step for one of those teams. And we'll send you some details this week about how you can get started serving here at The Journey. Because the first key to serving like Jesus is to make yourself available to be used by God. Now, back to your notes. Here's the second step, and it's this. Serving like Jesus means being grateful. Serving like Jesus means being grateful, having an attitude of gratitude. You know, in the Bible, uh, there's a, a, an incredible story in John chapter 11 of Jesus serving in a very, very powerful way. Jesus' friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus and his disciples had traveled to the town for basically for the funeral. But all the while, Jesus had something much bigger in mind. He was planning on serving God and serving this family and serving Lazarus by raising Lazarus from the dead. So that's a pretty big serving deal. Now, when Jesus got there, the first thing that he did was he prayed. And, you know, he could have prayed silently, but I'm really glad that he prayed aloud so that everyone there could hear what he was praying and so that we could all hear this prayer today as well. We find this in John chapter 11, verses 41 and 42. It says, so they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. In your notes, just circle those words, thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Jesus is being grateful here. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. You see, Jesus had an attitude of gratefulness in everything he did. He started with gratefulness. He prayed with gratefulness. Now, you might think, well, hey, well, I'd be grateful too if I had the power to raise people from the dead. But it wasn't just the good times that Jesus was grateful. Jesus was grateful in the tough times. Jesus was grateful when he was being criticized. Jesus was grateful when things weren't going well, when things weren't easy. This was the attitude of his ministry. And if we want to serve God the way that Jesus served, then we need to have this attitude as well and be grateful. In fact, let's read this next verse aloud very gratefully. Are you ready? Go. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Now, why do we worship and serve God with gratefulness, not out of a sense of duty, but out of a sense of delight. Well, we serve him with gratefulness because of all that he has done for us, because of what Jesus did for us in giving his life for us on the cross so that our sins can be forgiven. He saved us. And if he never did anything else for us ever again, that's enough to serve him gratefully for the rest of our lives. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Paul writes this, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. So Jesus saves us when we put our faith in him. And out of gratefulness for him forgiving our sins and giving us a purpose and meaning in life today and a home in heaven, out of gratefulness for that, we serve him with a loving, right, grateful attitude and heart. So let me ask you a question today. And you don't have to answer this out loud. Just answer this quietly in your heart or in your mind. But over the last couple of years, during all the troubles that we've been through because of the pandemic and all that's happened in our nation and around the world, have you found yourself grumbling instead of being grateful? Listen, it's easy to do. I think we've probably all been there. Grumbling about things instead of gratefully serving God and serving others and serving our church. Now, don't get me wrong. It's better to serve than not serve. But if you're serving like Jesus, that means that you're serving with gratitude in your heart. And if you're not serving gratefully and joyfully, then you're not fulfilling this purpose for your life. This week, let's make it a point to be more grateful and less grumbling. Can we do that together? I'll make it a point to do that. You make it a point to do that as well. So be available, be grateful then back in your notes. Here's the third attitude 
for serving like Jesus. Serving like Jesus means being faithful. It means being faithful. That means you don't give up. You don't give in. You keep going. You don't quit in the middle of your assignment. Jesus didn't quit on his assignment. In fact, at the end of Jesus's ministry, but right before he was arrested and crucified, here's what he said. He said, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Listen, I want you to be able to say that one day in heaven, that you completed the work that God gave you to do. You see, Jesus was faithful in fulfilling his service. He didn't give up. And if you're going to be like Jesus, it means serving him as long as you live for the rest of the days of your life. Now, one day you may retire from your job, but you will never retire from serving God and serving others. You'll never retire from ministry because it gives your life purpose. So how do you remain committed and remain faithful in serving God for the long haul? There's only one way to do it, and it's to remember that what you're doing really matters. Remember that the way that you're serving God by serving others really matters. Now, let's be honest. Most of what we do every day, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's not going to matter next week or next year or at the end of our lives. Most of what we do each day, certainly it's not going to matter for all of eternity. But anytime you serve someone in Jesus's name, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem, that matters. It has eternal implications. That's why the Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says, always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Take your pen, circle that word nothing. Paul says, nothing that you do for God is insignificant or useless. That means that it all matters, even the seemingly small stuff, because in God's eyes, there's no such thing as small service. You know, Jesus even said, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, that that counts, that matters. So real servants of God, they do everything. They do every task with equal dedication because they know that it all matters. So whether you're serving in some kind of big way that people can see or some kind of small way that nobody even notices, if you are doing it for Jesus, it matters. It matters. So don't mistake anonymous with insignificant. It makes, uh, in fact, it makes me think of uh, a lot of the real servants that we have here serving at the journey, people that I consider real heroes. In fact, let me just give you a little quiz and let's see uh, how well we do on this. For, for example, do you know the name of the people who serve on our welcome team, who greet you on your way into the service every week? Do you know every name of every person who waves and welcomes you or gives you a mint on your way into the service? How about this? Do you know who's serving in the nursery and Journey Kids this weekend? Do you know who that is? Or do you know the names of all the musicians who are here on stage today? Or do you know the names of the people who serve behind the camera and behind the soundboard and with the lights and the video and the PowerPoint and all those kind of things? Do you know the names of the people who prepare the programs every week so that as we worship together, we can take notes and, and read the Bible and take next steps together? I didn't think so. You probably don't know all of their names, but you should thank God for them because the truth is all of that is done by anonymous volunteers and it's all important. It all matters. So have you ever wondered why you're here at the journey? I'll tell you why. You are here because God knows that you have something to give. You have ways that you can serve our church. God didn't bring you here to sit and soak and enjoy and do nothing. No, he brought you here to serve. He knows that you have something, some talent, some ability, some uh, experience in your life that God can use to make our church a better place, that God can use to impact lives in the name of Jesus here. And when you boil it down in life, all of life comes down to two questions. We have two options in life. And the options are, you can either waste your life or you can invest your life. Can I ask you, which one do you plan on doing from this day forward? Are you going to waste what God has given you just on yourself and your own pursuits? Are you going to invest that in something eternal, something that lasts, something that's changing lives and making a difference? The best use of life 
is to invest what God has given you for his purposes to serve his church because that pays dividends over the long haul. You know, one day at the end of your life, you're going to stand before God and he's going to ask you two questions. First, he's going to ask you life's most important question. It's the question of salvation. It's the question, what did you do with my son, Jesus? Did you believe in him and put your faith in him to save you? Or did you reject him and go your own way? Listen, that question really, really matters because the answer to that question will determine your eternal destination. But the second question that God is going to ask you, he's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the resources I gave you, with the shape, with those spiritual gifts, with those abilities, those talents, that freedom, that education that you received? Uh, what, are you, what did you do with the things that I gave you? What did you do with your shape? And you're going to say, well, God, you know, I mean, I was a little busy. I was kind of chasing my own dreams. I had some other things I wanted to accomplish, so I didn't really do anything with them. And God's going to say, eh, wrong answer. <laughs> He's going to say, no, what were you thinking? Do you think I put you on earth just to serve yourself, just to fulfill your own ambitions? No, I put you there to serve me by serving others. And listen, you may think that nobody notices what you're doing and how you serve in Jesus' name, but I can promise you, God knows. God sees what we do as we serve others in Jesus' name, and he always keeps his promises. You know, here on earth, uh, they'll sometimes give you an award for 10 years of faithful service or 25 years of faithful service at a company. But, you know, when you get to heaven, God says, I'm going to give you eternal rewards for your faithful service. Let's read our final verse aloud together from Matthew 25, 21. It's the words of Jesus. Are you ready? Go. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities Let's celebrate together. Listen, I want God to be able to say that about you one day in heaven. I want God to look you in the eye and be able to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. You took what I gave you. You, you, you worshiped me. You fellowshiped with other believers. You, uh, you took steps to, to grow in your faith and become more like Jesus. You used your shape to serve others and to make a difference. Well done. Good job, my good and faithful servant. Come into eternity. Let's celebrate together. The question for you to consider today is, is that what God is going to say to you? Is God going to say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant? Is there anything in your schedule right now that's not just about you? and what you want, and what you're chasing? Uh, is there anything in your schedule right now where you're serving other people or serving the church unselfishly, or are you just too busy? Or do you just have other priorities in life? You know, one day, Napoleon looked at a map of China, and he pointed to China, and he said, there lies a sleeping giant. If it ever awakens, it will shake the world. You know, every week here at The Journey, I think, there is a sleeping giant here at the journey. And if every person who attended here served here, what kind of enormous spiritual impact would we have not only in South Florida, but all around the region and all around the world? And that's why I make no apology in saying to you that the most important thing that you will ever do is to use your shape to serve God by serving others. It's more important than your career. It's more important than your hobbies or all the other things that you have on your schedule. It's more important than anything else because none of those other things are going to last. But when you serve people the way that God created you to serve in Jesus' name, it has an eternal impact. I hope that you will use your life to do that. In fact, let's go to the Lord right now in prayer. And as we pray, just would you just pray this prayer quietly in your heart? Just pray, Father, I realize that you shaped me to serve. Forgive me for the times that I've put a do not disturb sign on my heart. Help me to see the interruptions as opportunities to serve. Help me to make time for what matters most. You've been so good to me. I want to give something back. I want to serve you freely and gratefully and faithfully so that one day I can hear you say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Now listen, if you've never discovered your purpose, but you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never believed in Jesus and committed to follow him. 
You can do that right now. That's the most important decision that you will ever make to trust Jesus to forgive you of your sins and give you a home in heaven. Would you just pray this prayer with me right now in your heart? Just pray, Jesus, today for the first time, I put my faith in you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the grave so that I could have a home in heaven. I confess my sin. I know that I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I've made mistakes in my life. I don't want to keep living that way anymore. I want to follow you from this day forward in the fellowship of your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.